Shalom and welcome to Shomer Mitzvot, Torah Observant, a series on practical messianic living and apologetics. I'm the author, Torah teacher Ariel ben Lyman Hanavi. Torah observance is a matter of the heart. It always has been and always will be. The Torah proper instructed the people of Israel to love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your resources. This is where Shomer Mitzvot begins, by loving Hashem and accepting Him on His terms. By this, I mean accepting His means of covenant obedience. For today, this means acceptance of Yeshua, His only Son, for Jew and non-Jew alike. Welcome to Towards Understanding Sacrifices and Atonement. I'm the author of this study, Ariel ben Lyman Hanavi. This is a 14-week study, and each class will be around an hour long. Most of the classes will be recorded live at the congregation at Kehilat Tenuvah in Thornton, Colorado. However, this first installment, because of technical difficulties, I'm actually reproducing it at my home. What you're going to need by way of study material is you're going to need, if you're in class that is, you're going to need the uh, packet of information that, I get, that I'm going to hand out to you, which will consist of the syllabus, the study itself, which is 40 pages long, and then there are two um, excurses in the back, uh, times of prayer by um, FFOZ and the uh, other paper that they have. Let me look at it here. The title is... Um, the title is Recommended Outline for Set Time Prayers. All of this is already going to be um, copied for you and put into a notebook for you. All you need to do is show up and receive it. Now, if you're listening to this commentary and you are not able to attend on Monday nights for the live uh, classroom setting, well then, each week I will try to make the audio available on our website uh, at graftedin.com. I'm not exactly sure where they're going to show up, possibly in the More Lessons section or possibly in the um, Media section. I haven't uh, settled on where I want to put them just yet. Again, um, there are 14 weeks of uh, lessons in front of us, and uh, we'll have three intermissions for She'elut Utshuvot, questions and answers uh, as well. And I hope it will be an informative study for everyone, a challenging study to be sure. If you have questions, as always, you can reach me by email at Yeshua, that's Y-E-S-H-U-A, number six, number one, number three, at hotmail.com, Yeshua613 at hotmail.com. Another thing I want to mention is whenever necessary, or whenever um, possible, I'm going to utilize information from previous recordings. Much of this study was put together using information that I already wrote on the um, Korba note, the festival, I'm sorry, the, uh, the sacrifices. And so if there's previously recorded information that I can utilize uh, in each uh, study, in the audio lessons, then I'll go ahead and do that, okay? But for now, let's go ahead and get started. I want to start off uh, each session the same way every time. And what I'd like to do is open up by reading the Shema, the three paragraphs of the Shema. I'm going to simply read them out of my uh, Art Scroll Sidur Sephardic version. And if you have one of these, then you can follow along. Uh, starting on page 94 in the Hebrew, I'll read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. Then I'll read Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 21. And then finally, I'll read Numbers chapter 15, verses 37 through 41. For this first installment, I'm going to read the um, English first out of the Siddur, and then I'll read the Hebrew. But from here on out, at each as at the opening of each class after I pray, I'll simply read the Hebrew, and then we'll go straight into the lesson, okay? The English says, Hear, O Israel, Adonai is our God, Adonai the one and only. 
You shall love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your resources. Let these matters that I command you today be upon your heart. Teach them thoroughly to your children, and speak of them while you sit in your home, while you walk on the way, when you retire and when you arise. Bind them as a sign upon your arm, and let them be a tefillin between your eyes. And write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates." Now to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 13 through 21. And it will come to pass that if you continually hearken to my commandments that I command you today, to love Adonai your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will provide rain for your land in its proper time, the early and late rains that you may gather in your grain, your wine and your oil. I will provide grass in your field for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. Beware, lest your heart be seduced, and you turn astray and serve gods of others and bow to them. Then the wrath of Adonai will blaze against you. He will restrain the heaven so that there will be no rain, and the ground will not yield its produce. And you will be you will swiftly be banished from the goodly land which Adonai gives you. Place these words of mine upon your heart, and upon your soul. Bind them for a sign upon your arm, and let them be to feel in between your eyes. Teach them to your children to discuss them while you sit in your home, while you walk on the way, when you retire and when you arise, and write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates, in order to prolong your days and the days of your children upon the ground that Adonai has sworn to your ancestors to give them, like the days of the heaven on the earth. Now, Numbers 15, verse 37 through 41. And Adonai said to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, that they are to make themselves tzitzit on the corner of their garments throughout their generations, and they are to place upon the tzitzit of each corner a thread of tchelet, and it shall constitute tzitzit for you, that you may see it, and remember all the commandments of Adonai, and perform them, and not explore after your heart and after your eyes after which you stray, so that you may remember and perform all my commandments, and be holy to God. I am Adonai your God, who has removed you from the land of Egypt to be a God to you. I am Adonai your God. Okay, what I want to do now is turn back and read the Hebrew of that, that exact same section in the Shema, and then we'll move forward into the lesson, okay? The Hebrew reads, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Vahavta et Adonai Lohecha Bokolavavcha Uvcholnafshecha Vocholm Odecha Vahayu had Verim Haile Asher Anochi Metzavcha Hayom Al Levavecha Vashin Antam Levanecha Vedibarta Bam Beshivtika Vetaka Uvlechtaka Vadarech Uvshak Paka Uvkumeka Ukshatam La Ot Al Yadacha Vahayu Letotafot bain einecha, uchtavtam al mezuzot betaka uvish arecha. Now Deuteronomy eleven thirteen through twenty one. Vahaya im shemo tishmau el mitzvotai asher anochi mitzave et chem hayom la ahava et adonai elohechem ul avdo bechol levavchem uvchol nafshechem. Venatati matar artzechem, beito yore umalkosh, va asafta de ganecha, ve tiroshtcha, ve itzharecha. Venatati ese besadcha, liv hemtcha, le achalta ve savata. Hishamru lechem pen yif te, lavavchem, ve sartem, va avadtem, Elohim acherim vehishtacha vitem lachem. Vachara af Adonai bachem, va atzar et hashamayim, velo yye matar, va haadama lo titen et yvula va avadem. Mehira me al haaretz hatova, asher Adonai no tain lachem. Vesam tem et devarai e le al levavchem. Va al nafshechem. Ukshartam otam le ot al yedchem. Vahayu le totafot ben enechem. Velimad tem otam et benechem. 
לדבר בם בשבתך, בביתך, ובלכתך, ודרך ובשכפך, ובקומך, וכתבתם על מזוזות ביתך ובשעריך, למען ירבו ימיכם וימי ביניכם על האדמה אשר נשבע אדוני לאבותיכם לתת להם כי ימי השמים על הארץ. And now Numbers 15, verses 37 through 41. ויאמר אדוני אל משה לאמור, דבר אל בני ישראל, ואמרת עליהם, ועשו להם ציצית על כנפי בגדיהם, לדורתם, ונתנו על ציצית הכנף פתיל תחילת. והיה לכם לציצית, וריתם אותו, וזכרתם את כל מצוות אדוני, ועשיתם אותם. ולא תתורו אחרי לבבכם, ואחרי עיניכם, אשר אתם זונים אחריהם, למען תזכרו, ועשיתם את כל מצוותי. ויהיתם קדושים לאלוהיכם. אני אדוני אלוהיכם, אשר הוצאתי אתכם מארץ מצרים, לחיות לכם לאלוהים, אני אדוני אלוהיכם. אמן. אוקיי, מה שאנחנו הולכים לעשות זה פשוט להתחיל לקרוא את הדברים האלה. אני אתחיל עם הסילבוס עצמו, להתחיל את זה פשוט, כדי שאתם יכולים להגיד איזה דבר שיש לנו בפני, ואז נתחיל עם הלכה. עוד פעם, הלכה הזאת נתחיל towards understanding sacrifices and atonement. אני האוצר, תור תיאטר אריאל בן ליימן הנביא. In my teaser, I made this statement. Admittedly, many believers, both Jewish and non-Jewish, confess to having a superficial grasp of the subject of sacrifices and atonements when compared and contrasted to the once and for all sacrifice of Yeshua our Messiah. The questions that these topics give birth to are legion. Let me just name a few of them, okay? Bullet point number one, or question number one. If the Torah is still relevant for believers today, what about the book of Leviticus? Question number two. Didn't Yeshua, didn't Yeshua's death nullify all sacrifices? Question number three. Didn't Yeshua fulfill Yom Kippur 2,000 years ago? Why do we need to study it today? Fourth question. Just how were the Old Testament saints saved anyway? Fifth question. Why? Doesn't the book of Hebrews teach that the blood of animals was ineffective in removing sin? And the last question. Judaism today seems to teach that prayer has replaced the sacrifices. Is this true? And are the set time prayers of Judaism even relevant to me as a believer in Yeshua? Okay. Those are just some sample questions to kind of pique our curiosity. We will hit each and every question, I believe, in the study. What can you expect from this particular study? Well, as far as I can, uh, or as to the best of my ability um, as a teacher, this is going to be a systematic look at the foundational sacrifices of Leviticus and their relevance to 21st century believers in Yeshua with an emphasis on the Yom Kippur promises. Next, through our studies, we're going to have an informative apologetics section that's going to deal with today's Judaism and their issues with Christianity. This will include a study on the set time prayers, okay? It'll probably be around uh, week six or seven. Finally, um, I've got a specific question and answer session set aside near the end of the study that's going to address the possible construction of a third temple. Let's go ahead and look at the proposed syllabus, all 14 weeks. Let me read this to you. Uh, I must say that the weekly schedule is subject to modification by myself if I deem necessary. But here's what I'm looking at so far. Week 1, we'll have the introduction to Part 1, Vaikra Leviticus. Week 2, introduction Part 2, Washing and Wiping the Sins Away. Week three, we'll begin looking at the types of offerings, part A, and we'll start with the Ola Tamid, the continual burnt offering. Week four, we'll look at types of offerings, part B, and then we'll move into the five types of offerings on week four. 
Week five, we're going to have an intermission just so that everyone is tracking with the teacher. So this intermission will be a Sha'elot Utshuvot questions and answers session. That's where I'll make sure that everyone is kind of on the same sheet of music. I don't want to go too far without uh, making sure that everyone's kind of following along. Uh, it's not my goal to just plug along and chart through all the material and lose everybody in the process. And that's not what I want to do. So I've interspersed these um, intermissions so that I can make sure that we're all caught up. Think of it kind of like a little break. At week six, we'll keep moving into the study with apologetics part one. At week eight, we'll take a look at, I'm sorry, I skipped week seven. At week seven, we'll move into apologetics part two. At week at week eight, we'll move into Talmudic quotes and scriptural quotes. Week nine, we'll talk about Yeshua's bloody atonement sacrifice, and we'll look more closely at Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, which tends to be a chair passage in um, discussions like this. At week 10, we'll have another intermission, She'elot Utshuvot questions and answers. Let everybody get caught up, make sure that uh, we're not losing anyone again. And then going into week 11, we'll start into the material again at Leviticus 18, verse 5, another chair passage. And, the, and it's in, uh, the study is entitled, Torah Observance Equals Eternal Life, with a question mark after the word life. At week 12, we'll start turning towards third temple issues, a Q&A session there for the third temple questions. And then at week 14, we'll begin to wrap the study up with our conclusions. Um, I have an excursus from Tim Haig's book, The Letter Writer, uh, Yeshua's Atonement by Tim Haig. We'll look at that exclusively on week 13. And then week 14, the finale to the whole study will be just devoted to She'el Utshuvot again, questions and answers, so that we can kind of wrap our minds around what we've been looking at, okay? So that's the look at the syllabus weeks 1 through 14 so far as I've... Um, as I've forecasted. We'll see what happens to that schedule as we go through the study. All right, turn now to page one of the study, and uh, let's begin. I'd like to tell you right up front that all quotations in this study are taken from the Complete Jewish Bible Translation by David H. Stern, Jewish New Testament Publications Incorporated, unless otherwise noted. This particular written commentary was updated on January 4th of 2008, so it's fairly up-to-date. Also, just before we get started, if you'd like to get the materials and you're not attending the harvest, you're not attending the live sessions on Monday night, you may download the material off of our website at grafted.com, navigate from the homepage to the More Lessons tab right there on the homepage, and then near the bottom of the More Lessons page, this study is entitled Towards Understanding Sacrifices and Atonement. It's part of my Shomer Mitzvot Torah Observance series. There's one caveat, however. The material that I'm giving to the class who attends the live sessions, their notes are 40 pages long because the last five pages are the excursus from Tim Hegg's book, um, uh, Paul the Letter Writer. However, I do not have permission from Tim to publish that information to the web. Therefore, the online version does not include the last five pages of the uh, class version. So the online version is only 35 pages or so, whereas the class version is 40 pages long. Therefore, you won't be getting that if you download it off the Internet. Okay, and that's why. If you have any questions, you're certainly welcome to write to me, and uh, I'll see what uh, what issues I can address. Let's get going. Page one, let's start with a prologue to the study. I want to pull two significant quotes from rabbinic information. I want to start with one quote from the Babylonian Talmud, and then another quote from the Midrash Rabbah. I think they're fitting for our study, and after you listen to them, I think you'll agree with me. First, the quote from the Talmud, quote, And it is written, And he, Abraham, said, Lord God... Through what should I know that I will inherit? Reference to Genesis 15, verse 8. Said Abraham before the Holy One, blessed be he, master of the world. Perhaps may there be calm and peace. The Hebrew says, has v'shalom. Um, may there be calm and peace. Israel will sin before you, and you will treat them like the generation of the flood or the generation of the dispersion, in essence, the Tower of Babel. He, God, said to him, Abraham, No. He, Abraham, said before him, Master of the world, through what should I know? Again, Genesis 15, 8 is in, in view there. He, God, said to him, 
take a three-year-old heifer, and of course that, that statement there from Hashem, from God, is lifted from Genesis 15.9. Abraham continues his uh, request. He, Abraham, said before him, Master of the world, that is fine when the temple is th exists. Now Abraham's commenting on this statement that God gave him in the answer about bringing the animals. Abraham says, that's fine when the temple exists. When the temple does not exist, what will happen to them? Speaking of his progeny, his offspring. He, God, said to him, I have already established for them the list of the sacrifices whenever they read them. I consider it as if they have offered a sacrifice before me, and I forgive all their sins. End quote. That's lifted from the Babylonian Talmud, Tractate Megillah 31b. And I um, lifted that quote from Jacob Neusner's Babylonian Talmud Hendrickson Publishers 2005, the CD-ROM edition. I have it on my laptop here, so I'm able to access it that way. Let's pull another quote from the Midrash Rabbah. Again, this one is taken from the CD-ROM version. Again, uh, I have the Sansino Press, Limited Judaica Press, Incorporated, Brooklyn, New York, 1984, CD-ROM edition uh, by David Kantrowitz, the Sansino Midrash Rabbah. Quote, Rabbi Asi said, Why do young children commence with the book of the law of the priests and not with the book of Genesis? He's, uh, of course, referencing that when young children, in, in, uh, in, when they begin their studies of Torah, why do they start with Leviticus and not with Genesis? Surely, his answer says, surely it is because young children are pure, and the sacrifices are pure. So let the pure come and engage in the study of the pure. End quote. That's taken from the Midrash Rabbah to Leviticus 7, verse 3. Okay, with those two opening quotes from the rabbinic material to kind of um, uh, point us in the right direction, let's start with the prologue and move into the study. Mankind is a fallen race. No righteous deed, no amount of charity, no ostensible pedigrees in family eth ethnicity can ever make up for the fact that we, in and of ourselves, are hopelessly separated from a holy God. Human ingenuity cannot wipe the stain of sin from the hearts of men. Hashem, God, however, has lovingly provided a means by which mankind can be redeemed. Now, in the period of the Tanakh, which is an acronym for the Old Testament Tanakh there, the sacrificial system was given, among other reasons, as the vindication markers of the faith of an individual. How did this work? It's faith acted out in faithfulness. Obedience vindicates genuine faith. You see, obedience played a big role in demonstrating true and lasting covenant faith, both then as well as today. Individuals wishing to approach Hashem's sanctuary back then, whether it was the Mishkan, the portable tabernacle, or the later permanent structure known as the Beit HaMikdash, the temple, Anyone wishing to uh, uh, approach Hashem's sanctuary was required to bring some sort of atonement for the sin that they carried within themselves. Now, often the blood of the animal served this very purpose to, to provide some type of an atonement device. Yet, surely the animals themselves did not bring about lasting atonement. That is to say, the animal's and the blood that they provided did not provide a, a permanent forgiveness of sin. Yet, God saw fit to allow His perfect plan of salvation, tied into the eventual coming of His Son Yeshua, Jesus, to be acted out, as it were, through the temple rituals. You understand what I'm saying so far? The, the animals pointed towards something greater, and that's why I said earlier that the animals in and of themselves did not bring about a lasting atonement. The historical sacrificial system, however, was effective in covering sin, that is to say it sanctified the flesh. Also, it was effective in cleansing or wiping clean the sanctuary that uh, facilitated the, uh, the whole priestly sacrificial system. But ultimately, 
and this is the important part, the animals proved to be a mere shadow pointing to the true body of sacrifice found only in the perfect lamb of sacrifice. Of course, we're speaking of Yeshua. The earthly copies gained their validity from the heavenly realities. Now, the, um, the sacrificial system was not designed to accomplish for the individual bringing the animals the goal of purging the conscience. And that's an important point that we're going to have to remind ourselves about, okay? However, even though it was a limited solution, and the word limited there is in quotes, even though the animals were a limited solution, it was authentically God's solution. It was not made up by Moshe. He did not fabricate the animal system. God commanded Moshe to bring the animals, so it was God's solution. No Jew or Gentile, I might add, living in that time period was able to circumvent this system and remain officially within the community. You simply did not approach the the sancta without the prescribed, required sacrificial system set in place. You couldn't circumvent it. You couldn't just march into the holy place or the holy of holies and ask for an audience to see God. It wasn't going to happen. Okay? If we take Hashem seriously, and if they took Hashem seriously back then, then we will accept God's provision no matter what means or how limited that provision is. Okay? And this, I believe, is our first lesson in Torah logic. Okay, now that's the prologue. Turn now to page uh, three in the study, and you, there are the contents. You can see one through eleven if you have the notes that I've handed out in class. If you've downloaded the information from the internet, then you only have contents numbers one through ten. Okay. Uh, number one, introduction part one, Vaikra Leviticus. Number two, introduction part two, washing and wiping the sins away. Number three, types of offerings, A, Olatamid, continual burn offering. Number four, types of offering, B, the five types of offerings. Number five, apologetics part one. Number six, apologetics part two. Number seven, Talmudic quotes, scriptural quotes. Number eight, Yeshua's bloody atonement sacrifice and Leviticus 17.11. Number nine, Leviticus 18.5, uh, Torah observance equals eternal life. Number 10, Third Temple Issues, Q&A. And number 11, if you have the written notes that I've handed out in class, Yeshua's Atonement by Tim Haig. Again, if you don't have the notes that I hand out in class, you will not get that extra uh, uh, part 11 there. Okay. And at this point, much of this information has been pre-recorded, and so I'm going to read uh, in the notes from... Point one, uh, number one, which is on page four all the way through page five and to the middle of page six and stop at point number two there. That will be for next week's study. Um, much of this information already has been pre-recorded, so let me go ahead and now defer to the pre-recorded information for this portion of the audio commentary, okay? Well, this is the beginning of the book of Vaikra. Um it's also known as the book of Leviticus and the English title Leviticus comes from the fact that the book is primarily written about the many functions within the Levitical priesthood thus Leviticus um, is related to Levi in Levitical cult or the the, the priest of Le uh, the the uh, tribe of Levi and the uh, priests found therein our Hebrew, t Hebrew title however comes from the ancient practice of naming a book or portion after one of the opening few words like we've seen in just about every other Torah portion that we've studied the stone edition Tanakh has this to say about the book of, Le of uh, Vaikra let me make a quote there um, Quote, in the lexicon of the Talmudic sages, the book of Leviticus is called Torah's, Ka uh, Torah's Kohenim, or the Torah of the Kohenim, or priests, because most of the book deals with the laws of the temple service and other laws relating to the priests and their responsibilities. The opening chapters of the book, um, Stone Edition goes on to say, uh, relate 
to, I'm sorry, the opening chapters of the book deal exclusively with animal korbanos, or um, sacrifices. And they go on to say that this is a word that is commonly translated as either sacrifices or offerings. But the truth is that the English language does not have a word that accurately expresses the concept of a korban. The word sacrifice implies that the person bringing it uh, that implies that the person bringing it is expected to derive himself of something valuable. Um, but God finds no joy in his children's anguish or, anguish or uh, deprivation. Offering, uh, the word rendered from uh, Korban, is more positive and closer to the mark. Indeed, we use it in our translation, they go on to say. But it, too, falls short of the Hebrew Korban. Does God require our gifts to appease him or assuage him? Quote, if you have acted righteously, what have you given him? End quote. That's taken from Job chapter 35, verse 7. They go on to conclude, God does not become enriched by man's largesse. Uh, that's taken from the Stone Edition Tanakh Art Scroll Series, Messora Publications, page 243. Indeed, as we go on to study... Um, the sacrifices or the offerings, and I'm going to use the words interchangeably. Sometimes, for the sake of emphasis, emphasis, I'll use sacrifice, and other times I'll switch over to offering. But indeed, much of the concept of korbanot, sacrifices, is foreign to our 21st century ears. Um, could it be because there's no temple? Well, that could be one of the reasons. But as believers in Messiah Yeshua, we have come full circle and we understand that the Levitical priesthood has been superseded by his own effectual bloody sacrifice made on the heavenly altar. In other words, in God's um, timing of things, he, if you remember now, now listen carefully, he first introduced the Bible readers to the Melchizedek priesthood way back in Genesis. Melchizedek in Hebrew. And after learning of Malki Tzedek, we then get introduced to the um, Levitical priesthood in the book of Leviticus, where we're reading about. And then we learn of the Messianic priesthood, as uh, perhaps, say, detailed in the book of Hebrews most um, most uh, uh, effectively. And so, really, what we're talking about is that Yeshua has brought us full circle from the Malki Tzedek priesthood through the Levitical priesthood and back to as it were, the Malkitzedic priesthood. So a thorough study of the book of Hebrews, which is called Messianic Jews in David Stern's version, um, in my opinion, it would do well to help the average reader understand the concepts that the book of Aikra is ultimately pointing to. I know it can get um, confusing at times, but we're going to do our best not to be confused. In fact, this first commentary to, uh, to Leviticus Parashat Vaikra for the sake of establishing a foundation on the, sac uh, the sacrificial system. It's going to be lengthy. In fact, the written commentary is, what, 14 pages printed out from the Internet version. And for that reason, the audio is probably going to be broken up into three separate files of about 30 minutes each. So just get ready for a long read or a long listen either way, all right? For those of you who are new readers, it's imperative uh, that you understand what I've previously stated in a former parasha concerning sacrifices and our relationship to Yeshua as believers. So, um, for the new readers, or even just for the um, those of you who are veterans, here's a brief recap. I say brief, but as you listen, it's not going to be brief. Here's a brief recap for the people who are just joining our, our uh, study group. Okay, you ready? I took most of these notes from Parashat Vayechel, uh, which was, what, about three or four parashot to go. It's uh, the, the, one of the second to the last parashot in um, the book of uh, Exodus. Quote, As I stated in a previous parasha, God's system of animal sacrifices with their ability to cleanse or wash the flesh was never intended to be a permanent one. Now, we already know that using, again, 21st century uh, Christian hindsight looking backwards towards the temple and we know that uh, if it were to be permanent at least um, ongoing without any break in uh, the succession then we would not have seen the destruction of the temple in 70 AD but God was teaching us a very valuable principle through the sacrifice of Yeshua and that's what we're going to study conversely the animal sacrifices that we're going to study about in, Levit in Leviticus here were not intended to be a temporary fix either. Now, I use that term, temporary fix, because later on I'm going to talk about how that in, in Christian circles today, it's vogue 
to talk about the sacrifices as if they brought about some type of a temporary salvation for the individuals until Yeshua came. And I don't believe that's quite accurate either, so we're going to discuss that. In fact, um, the etymological background of the word Torah, etymology deals with the study of words and their origins and how they're used. The etymological background of the of this word Torah, the root word being an archery term meaning to direct towards the goal. Um, the root word also suggests that the fullest measure of Hashem's atonement, and the Hebrew word for atonement, uh, the root word is kafar, and it's usually translated to atone, or to cover over, or to make reconciliation, to pacify, to propitiate. In fact, according to Brian, Brown, Driver, and Briggs, uh, it also means to purge. Uh, the BDB uh, give me those definitions there. Um, and anyway, um, the fullest measure of Hashem's atonement was not found in the earthly copies, but rather in the heavenly originals. Now again, we know this using Christian uh, uh, theology or, or the Christian studies that we've undertaken, but um, there's some, some uh, aspects to the Christian studies that seem to leave gaps in our studies on the sacrifices, and that's what I aim to shore up here in this opening uh, section to my commentary. Yet, um, even though these uh, the sacrifices um, did not provide um, the fullest measure of Hashem's atonement, yet during the time period of the Tanakh, we must remind ourselves, the animal sacrifices were authentically God's system. They were not; it was not a man-made system. Uh, for instance, if we were to compare the sacrifices to, say, much of the prayers that are um, central in today's rabbinic Judaism, many of the prayers although they're um, linked directly to scriptural passages, we don't find any warrant, as it were, to teach our followers that prayer replaces sacrifice. In the time period of the Tanakh, there was no such uh, notion being taught. Prayer did not replace sacrifice. Rather, prayer accompanied sacrifice, or I should say uh, the heart, which had an attitude of prayer, um, accompanied the sacrifices as is, as indeed they should have um, if they were continued but um, the animal sacrifices what I'm simply trying to say is were authentically God's system they weren't man's system uh, or any other um, uh, any other invention in other words if you were a citizen of this community living back in the time period of the Tanakh and you were a citizen of this community of former slaves remember they came out of Egypt and you wanted to operate within a covenant relationship with its savior, of course we're talking about God, um, then you had no choice but to participate in the animal sacrif uh, the sacrificial system when approaching the holy tabernacle or later on the holy temple where God concentrated his glory. If you wanted to approach God, you must participate in the sacrificial system. There was no room for circumvention. You could not simply march up to the holy place and demand to have an audience with God without bringing some sort of sacrifice. And to be sure, even if you brought a sacrifice, you still could not go into the holy place or, uh, to be sure, you could never get into the Holy of Holies. So, um, many students of today, looking backwards, might question, why would Hashem require exclusivity? It's a good question, and I'm not going to imagine that I have all the answers, but I like to believe that because in his established order of things, the Torah teaches us that only the blood could make atonement for their lives. And you can read Leviticus 17.11, a verse that we're going to study in upcoming uh, Parshot. Tim Haig makes a case for the meaning of the word kafar um, as, quote, wipe off or smear on, end quote, uh, in this um, excerpt from a short paper that is available from his site uh, at torresource.com as of the 20th when I updated this commentary. So let me lift that quote and um, center our study there for a moment. Quote, here's Tim Haig. The root KPR... Um, that's the English rendering of the Hebrew letters. The root KPR is attested in the Akkadian base stem, kaparu, meaning, quote, wipe off or smear on, end quote. This is classified with kaparu tu, uh, rendered as, quote, pour bitumen over, end quote, and koper tu, which is rendered, quote, pitch tar, and pitch or tar or bitumen, end quote. And also with the so-called D stem, Kupuru, which is rendered, quote, to wipe off, clean, rub, ritually purify, end quote. 
Haig goes on to say, quote, the idea that kafar had, uh, has its base meaning to cover was strengthened by the fact that the same root is used one time in the Tanakh to mean, quote, to cover with pitch, end quote. And that's uh, referenced from Genesis 6, verse 14. Uh, Heg goes on to say, in this case, the verb appears in the call stem. And uh, those of you who know anything about Hebrew know that uh, verbal stems in the Hebrew language uh, operate in seven different stems, uh, seven different um, uh, binyani, binyanim um, uh, conjugations is what we mean. And so we have the call as being the base stem or the lowest stem that we can find. However, every other place in of the verb um, and he's still talking about kafar. Every other place the verb is found in the Tanakh, it is in either the pi'el, the pu'al, the heat pi'el, or the rare neat pi'el. And he's just mentioning some of the other stems that the verb conjugates um, into, from the call stem, which is the simple base root, uh, the, the prime root usually is how um, uh, Strong's Concordance will list it, prime, P-R-I-M dot root, um, a primitive root or the lowest root, and then it moves from there and builds into, like, it's, 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 for those of you who don't understand Hebrew, it's akin to saying the the word the English word do can get conjugated into the into the English word done or doing or or um, has done or will do, and in those different forms we understand that the root word is do, and from the root word do we branch out into other variations of the word do, which is of course the variation doing, done, has done, and it changes the tenses and, and intensity and so on. That's all we're saying in the uh, Hebrew here. Let's go back to Haig. Averbeck notes that, quote, from a methodolo uh, methodological point of view, uh, linguistically, the same root in a different stem is a different word, end quote. And um, Averbeck's uh, note within Haig's quote was lifted from Nidot, um to reference 692 through 93. Uh, Haig goes on to quote, say, as such, the call should not necessarily be taken to indicate the meaning for the pial and other stems. Thus, Haig concludes, the suggestion that kafar has as its base meaning, quote, to cover, end quote, has been discarded by many current scholars, including evangelical scholars, end quote. All right, and the whole Hague quote, uh, you, the reader, can go back and read his entire article, is lifted from uh, Tim Haig, The Meaning of Kafar at TorahResource.com, and that's um, right there on his front page. You'll see uh, the, the name of the article, which is called The Meaning of Kafar. Um, I lifted that from page one of that study. Now, let's get another viewpoint in, in um, comparison to Haig's or in um, contrast. Presenting the notion that the blood of the animals did not so much cleanse the worshiper as it cleansed the holy sanctum, we have a quote now from Tikvat David, Hope of David, um, from their website, and they write in an article entitled, quote, Understanding the Sacrifices of Israel Past and Future, end quote. Um, here's what they have to say. Quote, Most importantly, burnt purification and reparation offerings were made to cleanse the sanctuary of the people's sin and impurity. The sins and ritual impurities of the people were like pollution that stuck to the tabernacle or the temple. God's holy presence would withdraw from the land, which was also holy, if the people did not constantly cleanse to allow his presence near. This is the theology of Leviticus 15.31, which reads, quote, Thus you shall keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness by defiling my tabernacle that is in their midst, end quote. Uh, Tikvat David goes on to say, this is also behind Numbers chapter 5 verse 3, which they quote, you shall put out both male and female, putting them outside the camp that they may not defile their camp in the midst of which I dwell, end quote. They also reference Numbers chapter 19 verses 13 and 20 as well as Ezekiel 5:11 and Ezekiel 23:38 they conclude thus the levitical sacrifices were not for obtaining personal forgiveness or for making the worshiper clean in this sense they were not like the cross of yeshua which does bring forgiveness to the worshiper and makes him or her clean they were to clean the sanctuary of the people's sins and impurities so god's presence could dwell in a clean place, end quote. So, 
they draw an interesting um, comparison uh, or similarity between Tim Haig's um, article there. In fact, we're going to go back to Tim Haig's article here in a minute. Um, but keep in mind that they're they're already at this point we're seeing that um, these sacrifices were also necessary for God's temple. Uh, as when compared to the people bringing sacrifices. In fact, for the most part, when I was growing up in Baptist schools, I was always taught that the sacrifices focused primarily on the people, the worshipers, and they really didn't have any bearing on God's sancta at all, God's temple or tabernacle. And yet, as I've done my later studies as a rabbi, a messianic rabbi, um, I'm understanding now that the sacrifices do bear relevance to God's tabernacle. In fact, now let's go to Hig and watch how he seems to make reference to such cleansing of the tabernacle or temple as well. I'm sorry, you know, before I read Higgs' quote, let me tell you that the uh, Hope of David article was taken from www.hopeofdavid.com and it's the article labeled article number one. Now let's go look at Hegg again. Using um, the same article that Hegg wrote at his website, The Meaning of Kafar, um, this time from page two, he writes, quote, If we accept Averbeck's viewpoint that a primary meaning of Kiper, which is the PL stem of Kafar, um, if we accept that the primary meaning of Kiper is to be found in those places where the verb has a clear direct object, then its base meaning is to be found in connection with Yom Kippur for the verb which with direct object occurs only in Leviticus 16 and the comparable passages in Ezekiel 43 and 45. If this is the case, Tim Haig goes on to say, then the base meaning is, quote, to wipe away, end quote. For in these contexts, kafar has a direct effect on sancta. It wipes sancta clean, meaning it restores the status of sanctum to that which had been defiled. And that sounds very similar to what um, Tikva David was explaining above. Tim Haig goes on to conclude, in this way, the call meaning of the verb to cover with pitch, end quote, is connected to the meaning of the P.A.L., quote, to wipe with blood, end quote. Now, after listening to these, just these two, of course I've done more studies than this, but I only quoted these two for our commentary here today, I can agree as a writer with both aspects of this word kafar, as cover and as wipe clean. In other words, I see it affecting both the worshiper as well as the sancta. Um, it affects the worshiper as well as the sanctuary. For indeed, as the blood of the animals pointed toward the ultimate sacrifice of Yeshua, we, the cleansed worshiper, can now approach the Holy of Holies in heaven, as it were, without the fear of contaminating God's throne. That's really I, as I, how I understand the, the lesson being taught uh, by the um, commentaries that we just uh, referenced there. Whether or not, however, we could theoretically approach the earthly mercy seat as believers is altogether another issue. I've heard this brought up in midrashic circles. In fact, I've brought it up in my own midrashim. Um, whether or not, since we are now believers in Yeshua, if the temple were standing today, could we boldly walk right into the holy place and then, and then, as it were, into the Holy of Holies and perhaps gaze on the um, Aron Kodesh, the Holy uh, Ark, the Ark of the Covenant? Um, the question is brought up kind of, of uh, hypothetically. If we believe in Jesus, does that permit us to walk right up to and bypass the priestly system if the priests were here? Or to be more closer to be closer to um, maybe an application of my hypothetical situation. In the time period of the first century when the um, temple was standing before it was destroyed, post-resurrection we had believers in Yeshua, Peter, James, John, Paul, uh, people who believed in Yeshua, um, maybe not James, uh, maybe not John, I guess he was killed <laughs> in Yeshua's day, but um, let's just pick on Paul. Paul, were, Paul had access to the temple in his day. Are we to suggest that Paul was able, because he believed in Yeshua, or permitted to walk right up into the holy place and then indeed into the Holy of Holies without being stopped or apprehended by one of the priests that worked there? I believe that the answer is no. Even though he believed in Yeshua, he was not permitted to walk right up there because of God's order, uh, orders given to the priestly case to not allow anyone to come in there. Um, suffice it to say, and, and I can't be dogmatic, I mean, it is an interesting question. Maybe those of you listening to my commentaries who hold midrushes um, 
using my commentary material. Maybe you can uh, bring that discussion up to the uh, to the rabbi who's officiating. Uh, suffice it to say that with the above supplied information, we today can now better understand that our God was teaching each and every participant an important aspect of his established spiritual laws. Okay, and that concludes part one of our study on Towards Understanding Sacrifices and Atonement. Uh, the first installment was a little longer. Um, well, actually, we haven't, we haven't we haven't broken hour yet, so I suppose we're okay. Um, but it was a little more meaty because we need to establish the context of where we're going to be going. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer, and then we hope that you will be able to join us week after week at the Harvest, Monday nights. My class starts at 6.50 sharp. We'll begin with opening prayer, and then I'll read the Shema, the three paragraphs, and then we'll go straight into the study. So be there right on time if you can. Again, if you're not able to attend the Monday night classes, I will upload the audio content weekly. Uh, I'll probably try to get it uploaded by Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, you know, as I recorded on Monday live, and then I'll try and get it up on Tuesday or Wednesday if I can, so that if you miss a class, you're able to listen online and uh, follow along and study with us, okay? Let's close with a word of prayer. Avino Malkinu, our Father, our King, Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We recognize that your Spirit is here with us today. It is He who is leading us and reminding us of the wonderful things that Yeshua the Master has done for us. And so, Father, we recognize that without Him, studying the Torah is useless. We thank you that you've sent your Spirit to help us to understand the words and to help us to get a grasp of what it takes for us to be pleasing to you. We know that in Messiah there's nothing we can add to his finished work. And so that's not the type of, pl of pleasing that we're seeking to do. Rather, we try to do what you're asking of us to do. Uh, you've told us to be holy because you are holy. This is a commandment, and we want to walk into your ways. So help us to, um, uh, to be children of God, to be light, to be salt in this earth to be a witness for your kingdom, and to uplift your name, to draw all men to you by the lifestyle that we lead. Forgive us, Father, where we fall short. We're going to make mistakes, and we're going to misunderstand the text uh, here and there. And that's why we continue to look to you, who is the author of everything that we read in your word. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son to die on our behalf. The animals pointed towards him, and now that he has come, we can rest in his finished work. Thank you that you've given us full atonement, full assurance of the forgiveness of our sins through the perfect sacrifice of Yeshua, our Messiah. We'll continue to bless you, Father, for all the things, the wonderful things that you're doing at this Kehila, at this harvest, and in the uh, Torah communities that are being raised up around the world. It's under the authority of Yeshua that we do these things. Amen. Amen. That concludes our show for today. It is my desire that this continuing series of teachings will assist the average non-Jewish believer or new Messianic Jewish believer in his desire to become a more mature child of God. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your forefathers and loved them, and he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. Because the Torah is written on the hearts of all who truly name the name of Yeshua as Lord and Savior, it is meant to be followed to the best of our ability. We have no reason for fear of condemnation or the trappings of legalism. My name is Ariel ben Lyman Hanavi. The intro and outro song were written, produced, and performed by Ryan Kingsley. For more information on contacting Ryan, you can reach me by email at yeshua613 at hotmail.com. That's Y-E-S-H-U-A number 613 at hotmail.com. 
or visit our website at graftedin.com. That's graftedin.com.